Well, good morning, everyone. We are so grateful that you've decided to join us uh, for this webinar. It's been a long time coming, would you say, Frank? Uh, we've had multiple, multiple questions from uh, the ministries that we serve in regard to how to perform an audit of your church bookkeeping. And um, we are, you know, Frank is um, so willing to help anyone with the uh, knowledge that he has. And so we're very excited to have Frank Arva lead us this morning in how to perform a review or audit um, of your church's uh, finances. This is an area that really um, is a protection for those that lead um, in the area of finance in your ministry. So we are grateful for Frank. Frank comes to us with a great um, broad knowledge of, of, about how to perform an audit um, of your bookkeeping because in his former life uh, for 30 years, he was an auditor for the IRS. And uh, so he brings that to the ministry setting. And we are so grateful, Frank, for you. Frank, um, is from the Sharmanstown Church of God. He's on staff as our financial secretary. He receives all of the income for the Eastern Regional Conference. And uh, he is the um, husband of Deb and the grandfather to eight beautiful grandchildren. So Frank, we're so grateful for you and for your love of the Lord mostly, but also for your service in the kingdom. So I'm gonna pray for you and then we'll have you uh, address the region. Father God, I thank you and praise you for Frank Garber. I pray, Father, that you would be with him now as he leads us in this vital um, teaching for the church, for the body of Christ. Uh, I pray, Father, you would just help those that hear this either live or later, that they would understand how important it is for our ministry. So, Father, we thank you for what you're going to speak in and through him this morning. Bless him for his time. And mostly, we thank you for Jesus and the love that covers us all. In Jesus' name, amen. We will address any of your questions at the end, so please feel free to put those in the Q&A. And um, Frank, we're grateful for you, so I'm gonna uh, pull your slides up and um, it's all yours. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, I appreciate the prayer and the introduction and the opportunity that I have to be able to uh, address the conference uh, on this particular subject matter. Um, one of the things that uh, we are emphasizing on staff under the leadership of our executive director is that all that we do uh, should be grounded in scripture. And so as I thought about this presentation of why would a church want an audit and what is involved in an audit of church books and records, um, I was reminded of uh, God's word as recorded by Moses in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, where it's recorded a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. And as I thought about that, it dawned on me, uh, and certainly everything that there is was created by God and therefore belongs to God. And we, as his creation, uh, have been granted the privilege of being stewards or caretakers of his creation. Uh, and as a steward or caretaker, we have a fiduciary responsibility uh, for the tithes and offerings that are given to him through the church. And in keeping with that responsibility it is important that the church periodically review the church finances. And so Colleen and I uh, thought it would be wise that we might put together this um, webinar uh, to help churches understand a little bit more about the process of auditing, uh, why we audit, uh, and uh, what an audit is. And let me just first of all say that an audit really is uh, to determine or authenticate uh, the books and records that are part of the church record keeping process. There are basically three types of audits. 
there is the external audit, which is normally performed by an independent accountant, um, a certified public accountant or a public accountant, uh, and results in a certified uh, certi sort of a certification of the finances of the entity. Uh, there is also what they call a review, uh, which is not certified, but it also results in the certification of the accuracy uh, of the books and records. Uh, there's the Internal Revenue Service Audit, as Colleen mentioned, uh, what I did for 30 plus years, uh, done by either a tax auditor or a revenue agent, uh, and that is to verify the accuracy of the return uh, that is filed. But the audit that we want to talk about today is the internal audit, uh, which is done in-house and is an audit that uh, most churches may be interested in that will be performed by uh, persons from the church uh, for the church. So the first question that we would like to address is why would a local church want an audit? And first of all, let me say that conducting an audit uh, is not a symbol of distrust. Uh, we don't uh, do an audit because we distrust uh, the treasurer or those people that are responsible for the finances of the church. Uh, it is a mark of good stewardship. It's a mark of responsibility. Uh, it shows that we are sending a message to our church that we care enough about what they give uh, to make sure that the gift is being handled in a responsible way. Um, we also would do an audit to protect uh, the integrity of those people that are involved in the finances of the church. Uh, protect the treasurer and those uh, that are uh, in incur the responsibility of the finances so that uh, we can attest to the church that what they're doing uh, is proper and protects the assets of the church. Uh, we build trust when we show to our people uh, that what we're doing shows that there's integrity and transparency uh, between the church and the donor and how the gifts are being handled. It sets a habit so that those who will follow uh, have the assurance that there is in place a proper procedure that will properly handle all the gifts that are given to the church. And in doing that, it assures that the donor that their gifts will be used as intended. It also provides for a check and balance so that uh, not one person is overseeing the entire financial operation of the church. Uh, there are multiple people involved so that uh, we see that one person doing one thing is verified by another person and that there is checks and balances, and we'll be talking more about that as we go through the presentation. So let me say, what is the purpose of an audit? Well, the purpose of an audit, for starters, is to independently verify the reports of the treasurer. Uh, each church, uh, regardless of the size of the church, should be uh, generating some sort of reports that will give the church an understanding of the receipts and disbursements that the church is incurring uh, throughout the calendar or fiscal year. Uh, an audit will follow the money and test how it is being treated uh, each step of the way. Uh, you know, when you think about it, uh, in the church setting, uh, maybe in the beginning, uh, you have money being 
sent to the church, uh, put in the offering plate, put in the mail, uh, electronically transferred to the church. And so the audit will, will trace that uh, from the origin to the final disposition of the funds. Uh, it documents that all funds are being accounted for. Certainly a, a church where the donors understand that there is integrity at all levels in the process are going to want to freely give to a ministry that they can trust in and feel a part of. Uh, they want to know that any gift that they give uh, will be given and used as stipulated by them. So that if a person gives to a building fund uh, or gives to uh, the acquisition of a particular asset, uh, that they know that they can trust their financial officers that they will carry out the wish of the donors. They will also, in the purpose of an audit, verify that there are internal controls. Uh, in any business, and the church being no different, if everything is being done by one person, uh, there is no internal controls. And so the church should have internal controls. And part of the audit is not only to verify the income and the expenses, but also to uh, what extent there are adequate internal controls that are part of the process. And then Lastly, an audit would determine the reasonableness of the system and the procedure. Um, certainly a larger church uh, that has a different uh, multiple funds, uh, who has larger sums of money coming in and going out, uh, may be uh, with a more detailed, complicated bookkeeping system. Uh, general ledgers, income and receipts disbursements. Uh, where a smaller church, it simply might be uh, the check register, which they uh, glean the information from there. Uh, but whatever it is, uh, there needs to be an assurance that the system is reasonable in light of all the factors. Well, let's look at the audit steps. Uh, so, uh, before you even began to conduct an audit, uh, you should sit down uh, and formalize the audit plan. Uh, what you're going to do and how you're going to do it, who's going to do it. Uh, you should uh, decide on whether or not you're going to be able to do the audit in-house uh, with people uh, from the church or possibly look outside the church to, to maybe members of another church that would come in to do the audit for you. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you can hire an outside independent accounting firm. Of course, uh, to that extent, you're going to incur the fee uh, that they would charge. So maybe uh, that would be something that you would want to do. Uh, but uh, it is also something that you could possibly do in-house. Um, before you even begin to look at any of the books and records, uh, the very first step, and this is so important, is to interview the appropriate persons. Uh, you wanna be able to sit down uh, with the people that are in charge, the, the treasurer, the financial secretary, uh, the chairman of your uh, stewardship and finance commission, uh, maybe even the pastor. Uh, and by doing this, uh, you're going to understand uh, how the funds are being treated. Uh, it's impossible to do an audit uh, without, first of all, knowing about what steps are being taken, uh, starting with the receipt of the income, the whole way through the disbursement of the income. So the first step is to do a detailed interview, ask those questions about what each person does and how they do it, uh, when they do it, uh, 
uh, so that when you do start to look at the books and records, you're going to have a familiarity with what has taken place. The next step, what we call the reconciliation. Uh, each church is going to have some sort of bookkeeping system. Um, it could be as detailed as a general ledger, uh, a cash receipts a disbursements journal, or it simply could be uh, the check register uh, that shows deposits going into the checking account and disbursements coming out of it. But whatever the bookkeeping system that is being utilized by the church, uh, there should be a reconciliation between the books and the financial reports that are being generated. Uh, and what that says is that when you look at the report, then you are able to go back to the books to see the details of where those figures came from. Once you are able to reconcile the books to the final financial report, you then want to test the accuracy of the books. Now, the idea of testing carries with it the idea of sampling. An audit is not done where you uh, audit or examine every single entry, uh, but it is sampling or testing a uh, sampling of those items, and that then gives uh, accuracy to the total. And what you're going to be testing uh, will be the income, the disbursements, payroll, and also internal controls. So let's start by talking about uh, the audit of income and receipts. Uh, the audit of income is probably the more difficult part of the audit uh, than the audit of the disbursements or the expenses. And we'll see a little later when we talk about the audit of uh, disbursements or expenses, uh, that you're going to be uh, able to verify payments uh, by tracing the disbursement to a canceled check uh, and to a receipt that will authenticate that the payment was made and the receipt will authenticate what the, re the expense was for. However, when it comes to auditing income, uh, you don't have a invoice and therefore you need to be able to trace the flow of income uh, from the origin uh, to the deposit of that income into any of the various accounts that the church may maintain. Also, when you're auditing income, uh, it can be cash, uh, much of what a church receives in the offering could be cash, uh, it could be the audit of income through checks that the church receives, uh, it could be uh, audit of income through electronic transfers, uh, PayPal, or any other of those electronic means that are available to churches. And of course, we know that uh, if the church is use, uh, utilizing those account, uh, accounting methods of receipt of income, uh, there are fees involved. And so the church may not get every dollar that was donated, uh, but only that which comes after expenses are paid or taken out uh, by the uh, facilitator of the electronic transfer. So then how do we audit income? Well, the best way to do that is on a test basis. Uh, and I would start with the major source of the income for most churches, and that would be the Sunday donations. Uh, part of the internal control of a church should be that the people that are opening the envelopes and counting the money uh, 
be persons that are independent uh, from the treasurer or the financial secretary. Uh, there should be multiple people that are involved in that process and not just one single person. Uh, that process of uh, accounting for the Sunday offering should be done uh, the very day that the money is received. Uh, and that money should be accounted for and deposited also on the date of receipt. I know that that creates some difficulty for some churches. Uh, and if that is not possible, uh, we would encourage the church uh, to secure those donations in a safe place on the church property and not to be taken home by anyone from the church to be accounted and deposited at a later date. Now, those that are counting the money uh, should have some sort of a report that documents exactly what it is that they are finding when they open up the envelopes and count the cash. Uh, uh, that would be the initial document that you would want to secure. Uh, that document might show not only the dollar amounts it received, but would break down where that money originated from, uh, showing that uh, the amount that came from envelopes, the amount that was loose, uh, and whether or not any of the money was received was designated uh, for a specific cause. Uh, that money then uh, would be totaled, and that money then will ultimately be recorded in some sort of original book of entry uh, so that uh, the financial secretary, uh, those counting the money, uh, will be telling the treasurer that uh, on such and such a day, uh, there was a deposit of X number of dollars that that person then would then be able to uh, record uh, in their check register as additional funds that would be available. And whether it be money for budget expenses or for designated expenses, then would be separated that the treasurer then uh, provides to the church. One other audit step uh, that would be uh, recommended is uh, just to look at all of the deposits. Um, Any more uh, churches may not get hard copies of their bank statements. And so it may be uh, necessary for the auditing team uh, to have access to the account online. And what you would be looking for is any unusual deposits uh, by size or source. Uh, Normally, uh, if the deposits were being made on a Sunday, you would expect to see uh, a deposit uh, that would show up on your bank statement probably that following Monday. Uh, and most churches, uh, the giving patterns are somewhat uh, standard. Uh, people usually give a, a similar amount. So there would be some continuity that each deposit uh, would be somewhat similar in amount. So if you as the auditor are going through and you see that on a particular uh, Monday, uh, the deposit was exceedingly low uh, or exceedingly high, then that probably would be one of the deposits you would want to trace back uh, to the original books of entry to see if it was recorded that way and then also uh, go back to the uh, original report by those counting the money to verify that indeed the, the sum that's recorded on the bank statement was what they had indicated was received that particular Sunday. Um, if in the process of auditing income, 
uh, you see a discrepancy between the amount that is recorded in the books uh, from that which is being deposited, uh, that would uh, require that the auditor spend additional time uh, determining what the difference is and why there is a difference. Uh, certainly that difference could be accounted for the, in the fact that not all money is being deposited. And if that's the case, uh, you would want to know why that is the case. Uh, and uh, if the deposit is greater than what the income shows for that particular day's offering, uh, it may be that there are additional monies that the treasurer uh, deposited uh, or the financial secretary dep deposited in addition to that particular Sunday offering, uh, such as investment income uh, that was commingled with uh, the deposit for that particular Sunday. Uh, so income uh, is part of the audit and a very important part of the audit, uh, but only part of the audit. Uh, we also, in the process of auditing, want to look at the uh, disbursement and the expenses. Uh, once again, in your initial interview, you would have determined how the expenses are paid, who authorized the disbursement of the funds, who has signature authority to sign the checks, and are expenses paid strictly by check or by check and cash. So in the audit of expenditures, uh, you once again want to go through the reconciliation process. You want to reconcile the original books of entry uh, to the reports that are being prepared by the Treasury. Uh, I would suggest that you're looking primarily at the year-end uh, record of disbursements. Uh, it could be the income statement. Uh, that will show the total income received and the total expenses that were paid in the course of the year. Uh, now, on the income statement, uh, that most likely will be broken down into various categories. Uh, you'll probably have expenses recorded uh, for payroll, uh, expenses recorded for uh, repairs and maintenance, for utilities, and for various aspects of the ministry of the church. And so what you're doing is you're looking at uh, a accumulation of disbursements for the year, but you want to be able to authenticate that those expenses that are on the report were properly recorded in whatever books are being maintained by the church. Now, just as we mentioned in the audit of income, we are not going to be examining or auditing every single disbursement that the church makes. And therefore, you want to sample the disbursements. Now, let me talk a little bit about what a sample is and how you come up with a sample. A sample, obviously, by definition, is a portion of the total. Uh, and so while we're not going to be authenticating every single item that was expended by the church, you want to look at a select few items. Now, that sample could be particular months of the year. You may want to say uh, out of the 12 months that you're going to look at every item that was dispersed in maybe February and June and October uh, and use that as a sample for the whole. Another sample may be based on the dollar amount, which is probably a better sample in my opinion. Uh, in the course of auditing disbursements, uh, we're really not overly concerned with 
uh, a lot of small dollar items. Uh, whether or not a item for uh, 50, 25, $60 um, was properly recorded is not as significant as to whether or not an item of $1,000 or more uh, was properly recorded. And of course, the dollar amount would be varying from church to church uh, and the size of the church. Uh, so uh, you may want to set your sample on selecting all items over a certain dollar threshold. Um, you may also want to uh, sample uh, what we call any large or unusual or questionable items. In the course of the year, uh, you're going to have certain items that are reoccurring uh, every month. Uh, every month you're going to have a utility bill. Uh, every month you're going to have uh, salaries. Uh, every month you're going to have uh, you know, uh, expenses for certain types of ministries. And so if those items are being properly recorded and you're seeing them in the disbursements uh, and you check one or two of those items, uh, you have a certain level of satisfaction for the entirety of those items for the year. Uh, but when you see an item uh, that does not reoccur and has a significant dollar, that certainly would be an item that would uh, pique your curiosity and should be one that you examine. Now, what is it that we're examining? Well, you're examining two things. One, you're examining the, the uh, fact that the item was actually paid, and the best way to do that is to trace it to the canceled check, uh, and that it was being paid for what it was intended for. And therefore, you want to see the original source document, uh, which would be the invoice. So the church should be maintaining both the checks and the invoices verifying that the items were paid. Now, as you probably know anymore, uh, canceled checks are not returned uh, to the individual or the church. And so once again, the auditors would want to gain access to the electronic accounts so that they were able to go in and document uh, that the church that the bank uh, identified a particular check by number and amount that coincides with the disbursements journal uh, that the church maintains. So that you can see that on such and such a date, the church dispersed uh, uh, $1,000 in check number 802, and that coincides with the bank statement that uh, that particular item was paid and cleared the bank. Uh, however, the check itself is not adequate to document what the expense was for. And therefore, it's important uh, that your uh, treasurer, as he or she is expending money, uh, also is keeping recordation of the item that was spent. So part of the church's responsibility is to communicate uh, to all those commissions and uh, those who are generating expenses uh, that in order for an item to be paid by the treasurer, the treasurer should be able to have a copy of the invoice uh, to determine uh, that it is indeed an item uh, that was being requested payment for that was in line with the church ministry. Um, when it comes to uh, credit cards, many churches have credit cards, and so the treasurer would be paying uh, a credit card fee. Uh, there should be actual receipts that 
uh, the holder of the credit card is accumulating and submitting to the treasurer uh, that they then will be able to uh, have as a source document verifying that the payment was being made. Um, now, uh, the Internal Revenue Service has a requirement that if you are paying an individual uh, an amount of $600 or more, and that individual is providing a service for the church, and that person is not uh, a corporation, uh, that you should issue them a 1099 uh, at the end of the year. Now that 1099 uh, starting in 2020 will be a 1099 NEC, uh, which is non-employee compensation. So uh, it's a legal requirement uh, that the church generate this for non-employees. And uh, I believe it's next Monday, uh, Jim Brandt will be talking about uh, employee versus non-employee and uh, who is an employee of the church and who is a non-employee of the church. But if the person is rightfully a non-employee, uh, the church has that 1099 requirement. And part of the audit step uh, is to verify uh, that they are being properly issued. Uh, along with that is the uh, the issuance of a W-9, uh, which is the church's way of obtaining the uh, employee identification number or the social security number of the non-employee uh, so that they can issue the 1099. And if they uh, fail to complete the 1099, uh, then the church has a, a requirement to withhold on that uh, at a rate of 24%. So it's very important that the church uh, be in compliance with uh, the 1099 requirements that are set forth by the Internal Revenue Service. Okay, uh, another item that is important uh, is the area of payroll. Uh, it's been my experience since coming on board with the conference that this is probably uh, the one area that most of our churches are not in compliance with. And once again, I would encourage you to tune in next Monday morning and Jim Brandt uh, is going to talk about uh, payroll uh, from the perspective of uh, what the church uh, should be doing uh, for those who are uh, employees of the church, uh, as opposed to those who are not employees of the church. Uh, it's been my experience that most churches want to call people that are performing services as non-employees, uh, which then would preclude them from having to deal with payroll. But uh, as I'm sure Jim will tell you next week, uh, that's not a option that the church has. Uh, if the person is an employee of the church, uh, then the church is required to uh, treat them as employee and issue them a W-2 and withhold from them and remit that withholding to the appropriate government agency. So as an auditor, uh, you want to make sure that payroll is being properly handled by the church. And in doing that, uh, you want to sample the church payroll records and trace to the cash disbursement. So a church probably should maintain some sort of a subsidiary ledger uh, showing uh, the individuals that are employees of the church uh, the hours that they worked and their hourly rate 
and uh, what their gross pay is and the amount that was being withheld and that the cash disbursement then would be the net of the gross less any amount that was being withheld. Uh, you also want to be able to verify the deposits into uh, to the respective taxing authorities. So money that you withhold from the employees uh, at some point in time, and that would depend on the dollar amount, how frequently that has to be remitted uh, to the taxing authorities. Here we're talking about uh, the federal government, we're talking about the state government, and we're talking about local government. Uh, you would want to verify the accuracy and the timing, timely filing of the payroll tax returns. Uh, the payroll returns for uh, most of these government units would be quarterly. Uh, and so you would want to verify that the uh, church is timely filing uh, the 941 in the case of the federal and the respective quarterly for both the state and local. Uh, and that those payroll returns uh, show and agree with the payroll records that the gross income is properly accounted for and that the withholding was properly remitted and that when you file the returns, uh, either there's a uh, excess amount or a, a, a amount due, in which case an additional check would have to be uh, verified as being paid. Uh, another item that uh, comes in when you're auditing payroll is whether or not the church is maintaining an accountable reimbursement plan. And by an accountable reimbursement plan, uh, what we mean is, uh, does the church pay for expenses incurred by its employees in conducting their job as an employee of the church. The difference between an accountable plan and a non-accountable plan, as it applies to payroll, is whether or not the amount that you reimburse is to be included in payroll or not. Let me explain. If the church has an accountable reimbursement plan, that is, do you necessitate a document from the employee before you reimburse them? For travel, that would be a travel voucher. Uh, for an expense, a receipt right, that they incurred the expense. Um, and if you have that accountable plan, uh, and if it is a legitimate business expense, then the amount that you reimburse the employee does not have to be included in payroll. However, if your church does not have an accountable reimbursement plan, meaning that you just give the employee uh, X number of dollars every month for him or her to or pay for these expenses with no accountability, or if you give them money, uh, but there's no document that is necessitated in order for them to get the money, then the amount that you paid that person does need to be included in payroll. So that then would be added to their gross salary as an item that should be in payroll. And so as an auditor, uh, it's incumbent for you to know if the church does have an accountable reimbursement plan or not. And depending on whether that does or doesn't, uh, that the church properly treated uh, this reimbursement either as income or not as income. Um, you want to verify that W-2s are being issued. Um, and for, uh, the Internal Revenue Service uh, clergy 
are considered employees of the church. However, uh, they are not uh, subject to FICA Social Security. Uh, they are under what we call SICA or self-employment. Uh, but the church can, uh, at the request of the pastor, uh, withhold that self-employment tax liability along with any income tax liability uh, and be remitted to the respective government agencies and then are properly uh, reflected on the W-2 that you issue the church at the end of the year. Okay, uh, the final item that we wanna talk about today is what we call internal controls. And though this is the last item that we're gonna talk about today, it probably is one of the first items that uh, you should have a handle on. And the reason I say that is because if your church has good internal controls, then you can, you have more assurance uh, that what's recorded in the original books, whether it be cash receipts or disbursements, uh, has a higher level of accuracy than if everything is being done by one person with no one checking the work of that person. Uh, so where you find that there are little or no internal controls, uh, your audit of both income and expenses may be more uh, detail and more in depth than when you find that there are good internal controls. Now, uh, internal controls, uh, there are a number of items that fall under internal controls. Uh, probably uh, one of the most important is what we call segregation of duties. Uh, it is important that duties be segregated uh, among two or more persons if possible. Now we understand that in small churches that this may be difficult, but rarely have I found that it's impossible. Um, if you explain to the person what their job is and help them to perform that job, uh, I believe that there are people that will step up and will serve in that capacity. Uh, what you want to do is you want to have different people doing different responsibilities within the church. Let me give you an example. Uh, the financial secretary and the church treasurer should be two different people. Not only should they be two different people, uh, but there should not be a relationship. They should be uh, independent of one another. Uh, uh, not related by blood, marriage, or employment, uh, relationship. They should be two different people. Uh, the, uh, the person that's uh, counting the money uh, should be different than the financial secretary. It should be different than the treasurer. Uh, so you want that uh, level of separation. Uh, that the person that's getting the money is different than the person that's spending the money. Of course, we do that within uh, here at the Eastern Regional Conference, as Colleen mentioned earlier. Um, all the revenue that comes into the conference is handled by me. Uh, I have no responsibility about dispersing any of the money. Uh, and Colleen has no uh, involvement in receiving the money uh, she is the person that is expending the money. Um, and so there should be different people uh, involved in these uh, transactions. Um, uh, does the treasurer or the person dispersed the sum have ultimate authority to spend money wherever he or she wants to? Uh, is there some sort of a check and balance uh, that 
the treasurer is only expending money that is authorized by those who are within the church have the authority to expend money. Uh, so that when the treasurer pays a bill, uh, it should be documented somehow that that bill is authorized for payment. Now, in some cases, that may be uh, automatic. Uh, the treasurer knows that each month he or she has to pay the electric bill. Uh, but what about when uh, a, a invoice comes across the treasurer's desk uh, for the purchase of a particular item uh, or a particular repair or to disperse money to another individual, maybe a benevolence. Uh, that should not be simply the treasurer's responsibility. Uh, someone should be authorizing that, uh, that the treasurer knows that it is within her or his responsibility uh, that that money is properly authorized for payment. Um, uh, are the transactions recorded in the correct year? That's extremely important in the year end, especially from the standpoint of income. Uh, that the financial secretary would want to give credit for any item that was donated uh, to the ind by an individual uh, in the year that that person gives the donation. Uh, that usually is based on uh, when it's received and when it comes right down to it, uh, when it's postmarked in the case of a donation that is given by mail. So that if it's postmarked within the year, then that should be given credit for that person in the year, even if that money does not get deposited until the next year. And so checks and balances are, are very important. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, you want to be able to uh, make sure that uh, the checkbook is safeguarded, uh, you know, that people cannot uh, get access to uh, the checks of the church. You want to make sure that the donations are safely guarded. Uh, that's why it's important that uh, the money is accounted for and uh, deposited as soon as possible. And if it can't be done on the same day, uh, that it is safely secured uh, on the premise in the safe uh, that people cannot get at it. Uh, in no case do you want to authorize money uh, leaving the church uh, and uh, be taken home or outside the church premise other than to be deposited uh, in the bank. Um, another item that we just quickly mentioned is the, the idea of uh, the, uh, uh, where you have uh, petty cash. Uh, Petty cash is probably something we would discourage, but we understand that in some cases uh, it's necessary for a church to maintain petty cash. Uh, and where you do that, uh, what you want to do is uh, you don't want to not deposit cash that you receive uh, and keep it in petty cash. But what you want to do is take all the cash and deposit it and then write a check to cash uh, to fund your petty cash, and then uh, keep the receipts as that petty cash is dispersed. So all of this um, are steps that you should take. Uh, we do uh, provide with for you uh, uh, a church audit check sheet that will be available uh, to each one. Uh, through the sites that you're looking at uh, and the notes uh, for the audit uh, will also be available and certainly uh, my email and phone number uh, there are also available. Uh, we want to just close by returning to scripture. 
And uh, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, we read this. Whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted all. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you your you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And so we are charged with an awesome responsibility, and that is to protect and to care for what has been entrusted to us for God so that we properly handle it and that we gain the confidence of those that are part of our church and above all, uh, that of God who has gifted this to us that we may further his ministry. Thank you for allowing me to share with you. And we do want to answer any questions that you might have um, at this time. Frank, thanks so much. There, so far, there haven't really been any questions in the um, uh, question and answer section. So if, they, if you want to put any in there now, you're welcome to. Uh, one thing that I wanted to highlight, um, Frank, I think it's a great idea to have those that are going to review your books that, or audit your books, the team that does that, that they would have access to the online because most things are now done digitally. Like when I do the, um, for our CPA who does our review, I go online and I print out copies of those canceled checks. That's easily done. However, if you're going to give access to your online record, to your online bank account, it would probably be a really good protection for you when the review or audit is finished that you would change your password. You wouldn't want to leave that exposure to the team of people that had been reviewing your books. Would you agree with that, Frank? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think so. I think that would be important to protect uh, the account there um, that when your the review is done that you would change your password if you gave online access to them. That's fine. Um, in the region, uh, I would say the most uh, problematic things that we see, and so if you're preparing for an audit, you would want to make sure that these things are um, in place. We The separation of duties tends to be an issue um, for those that we are helping along the way to do things a little better. Uh, to make sure that the in is done by one person, the out by another. And we understand that a lot of times our church plants at first, they don't really have the people that are called and qualified to do those roles. And for a while it has to be, um, you know, one person, but as soon as possible, be praying about that next step for you. And really another piece is that it, the pastor should not be on any of the financial records. We don't encourage pastors to be on our bank accounts. Uh, it's a protection for them. They're called to preach and teach. Um, so that's very important. Payroll is always an issue. Cash handling is generally an issue for how that's handled. Um, and accountable reimbursement, Frank. Um, I think we should make sure that um, those that listen to this now or later, that they understand that there are some things with the uh, afford Affordable Care Act with medical reimbursement that are no longer able to be reimbursed tax-free. So if you are re reimbursing for things that are medical in nature, we would ask that you would reach out to Frank or myself um, because they are, it's a, it's a complicated answer at this point, I would say, for the Affordable Care Act. So if you're reimbursing for medical, um, please be careful and cautious with that. Reach out to us if, us if you don't know if it's actually a taxable event or a non-taxable event to an employee, you would be reimbursing for medical. Uh, yeah, one, of the things, one of the things that you'll, uh, we made available to you is what we call a church audit check sheet. Uh, and it's kind of a, uh, 12 items uh, that kind of walk you through uh, an abbreviated fashion of what I shared with you. Uh, and uh, it will help you to, to properly uh, plan for your audit uh, and what to do. 
and you'll see at the very end of it, I think this is extremely important um, that you prepare a written report. I mean, uh, a lot of energy is going to be put into this by your treasurer and financial secretary. Um, and so uh, I believe it's incumbent upon you to take the time to put into uh, a narrative form uh, um, what it is that you did, you know, the audit steps that you took, uh, what you find, and then any recommendations uh, that might be helpful. Uh, so uh, it's a, this is a good policy uh, for the church that, uh, that it's documented in this fashion. I think what was really helpful about your presentation, Frank, is that Whenever you do like a test of what's been expensed, you know, with a cash disbursements test, the expense part of the of the ledger, and then the income side, that you don't have to test every item through the year. I think that a lot of times uh, in ministry, we feel like absolutely everything in order for it to be a clean audit has to be tested. So that it's a sampling, really, would you say, is a good word for it of those, the income as well as the expenses uh, to get a good idea of um, accountable, that things are being done accountably and in good order. Uh, yeah, and you know, back when I was in my previous life, when I wore the dark hat, uh, <laughs> you know, it was, it was stressed to us that the, uh, that your audit plan could be expanded or contracted as necessary. So that when you start out your audit, you're gonna have a plan, uh, you're gonna uh, have a sampling uh, of what you wanna do. Um, but as you get into the audit and you find that uh, uh, the church is in compliance uh, and that whatever sample items were uh, properly documented, you have good internal controls, uh, you may want to contract your uh, audit and, and say, well, uh, you know, we're not going to do every item that we originally planned. We're, we're going to limit it. Or just the opposite. Uh, you know, if you say, well, we're going to sample these items, but you're finding numerous errors and problems, well, then it's incumbent upon you to, to expand the audit and to look at more items. You know, once again, the whole idea of this is not to point a finger to the treasurer, but it is to make sure that what is being done is being properly handled by the church. Um, and maybe your treasurer uh, is doing the best job they know how to do, but no one ever sat down with them and explained to them that there's a better way to do it. And through this audit, uh, you're going to be able to do that. Uh, and certainly uh, the conference is willing to step in and to help. Uh, we're not going to do the audit for you, but once you've done the audit and you say, well, we seem to have a problem in this particular area, uh, what suggestions do you have? Uh, we'd be glad to, to, uh, to sit with you uh, virtually at this point in time, most likely uh, to, to come up with, a strategy to, to help you and your church uh, to do a better job for that. We really, um, we really believe it's a protection for, for the ministries, you know, that uh, they're done in a way that protects the people that are serving and handling the finances. And uh, there's a lot you can learn about how to do things better. And that's okay. It's a good thing. Yeah. And I would say, you know, you know within the church, we, we like to think everyone is, honest and above board. Uh, however, the reality is that uh, sometimes good people do bad things. And, uh, you know, if you ever, uh, you know, in a, a nonprofit or even for profit, you know, when there's embezzlement involved, one of the things you always hear is, well, we never thought that person would do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, and we're not saying that all mistakes are done purposely, uh, but you have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that money that the church receives and dispersing is being properly handled. Right, right. That's great, Frank. Thank you so much for sharing your 
breadth of knowledge with us this morning. We are so grateful for that. And for those that watch later, I would, I'll be putting the link for the document to help your church walk through an audit. So Frank, I was wondering, would you be willing to pray us out? Well, one, is there a question here from Pat? Uh, oh, um, yes. His treasurer was wondering, he said, you mentioned on Sundays, but deposit money right away. But can you roll Saturday night's offering numbers into Sundays? Is yeah. You know, once again, the ideal situation is that, you know, that the day the money is received, that it's deposited. And that's, that's, that's the Cadillac principle. Uh, where that's not possible, uh, then we certainly would just encourage you to uh, safeguard that money in a, a proper, appropriate way. Um, we we do, and you could do this, and we, we do this at the conference where uh, even if we're making the deposit on one day, we make two separate deposits. That way when Colleen is looking uh, at the deposits, uh, she'll know that this deposit is from this source and this deposit is from this source. Uh, so maybe what you would want to do is if you make that deposit on Sunday, but it has Saturday and Sunday, uh, make a Sunday, a Saturday deposit on Sunday and a Sunday deposit on Sunday. Uh, just to separate the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could do it. On okay. Day. Okay. All right. Uh, Will you pray with me? Father, um, you know, sometimes uh, we think of kingdom business as uh, preaching, uh, teaching uh, the gospel message. And certainly that is so, so important. Uh, but kingdom business also includes uh, accountability when it comes to uh, finances. And as we read in Luke, uh, there is an awesome responsibility placed on uh, the church to properly account for the income that has been entrusted to us. And so, Father, I would pray for all of our churches that we simply would not look uh, to provide this ministry uh, without integrity, uh, that we would be open and transparent, uh, that we would prayerfully consider those that we're going to ask to step in the position of treasurer or financial secretary, uh, that we shouldn't just simply uh, take anybody, but someone that called the ministry, someone that has a heart for this, someone that sees it more than just uh, writing checks or uh, depositing money, but that they see that it's, uh, that behind each dollar is a soul, uh, and that the money would not be hoarded, uh, but what is freely given would be freely given, uh, that, that it wouldn't be a, a reservoir, but it would be a, a, a flowing stream that money would come in and go out to further the ministry of the kingdom. Uh, Lord, thank you for men and women that are gifted this way and are willing to use their ministry. And we pray for each of our churches in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much, Frank. Mm -hmm. Have a great day, everybody.